totally scared me.
testing. Testing. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds. It's uh, my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Catherine Ferguson, and she'll be speaking on pericardial diseases. Our program today is underwritten by an educational grant through OSUMC Graduate Medical Education, and a disclosure statement has been signed is, and is on file in the Graduate Medical Education Office. Dr. Ferguson attended the Oklahoma State University College of Osteopathic Medicine, graduated in 2010. She then completed her internal medicine residency here at OSUMC in 2013. And Dr. Ferguson is currently a second year cardiology fellow here at OSUMC. So please welcome Dr. Ferguson. giving an anatomy, physiology of the actual pericardium. We'll go through acute pericarditis, um, complications, effusion, tamponade, constrictive pericarditis, um, and then we'll talk about uh, more specific pericarditis like bacterial. And then we have a um, case study we actually had in the ICU which almost covers all those cases in one at the very end. So we'll show you our ECMO and kind of talk about that too. So let's go ahead and get started. So. Um, there's two main layers of the um, pericardium. There's a monolayer membrane made of mesothelial cells, collagen, and elastin fibers. This is the main part that attaches directly to the epicardial layer of the um, surface of the heart. This layer then reflects back upon itself right at the origin of the great vessel. Um, this then reflects back and creates the parietal layer, which is the fibrous layer. In a normal heart, it's about two millimeters thick. This is the layer that usually uh, becomes more thickened when we see in between these two layers is where the pericardial sac is located. In a normal heart, it uh, contains about 50, millimeter, 50 mils excuse me, of pure fluid. If you look here, you can see right about in there is where our normal fluid would be located. The normal function of the pericardium is to maintain the position of the heart. Um, it's to keep the heart pretty much constant in the chest um, during respiration. It also helps to create a barrier in, um, from infection. Anytime we have infection in the mouth, in the throat, it helps to keep it from crashing down into the deep incisors of the heart. It helps to create a lubrication between the pericardial layers when the heart is actually beating. Um, there's also mechanoreceptors and baroreceptors, as well as phrenic afferent present. The roles of these receptors are somewhat um, under, incompletely understood. We think they help participate in reflexes, and they also transmit pericardial pain that we'll see in pericarditis. The main mechanical function helps to also create a restraining effect on the cardiac volume. Um, it's kind of described as a, similar to what um, rubber does when it's um, pulled and restrained. At low applied stresses, which are physi physiological level, it's usually pretty elastic, but it hits a point where it's um, pulled to the maximum stretching point, and then you start to get resistance. If you look at this chart here, you'll see along here, it's pretty elastic and it can stretch pretty far. Then we hit a maximum volume where we start to get, um, feel res get resistance, and that's when we start to see tamponade and restriction of heart filling. Um, we also notice that over time, when there's chronic slow filling, this plateau level here will extend further out and it can expand further depending on um, <coughs> further time. So specifically, acute pericarditis, um, these are symptoms or signs of pericardial inflammation of no more than one or two weeks in duration. The majority of cases are usually idiopathic. We assume the majority of cases tend to be viral. 5% of patients presenting to our ER, um, we attribute to pericardial pain for the non-acute Coexistence of myocarditis will usually see a um, slight elevation in biomarkers. So the history the patient will present with, the main thing you'll see is chest pain, and it actually can be pretty severe. It's most often pleuritic and pain. Patients will complain of taking a big breath in and having really severe pain. It's usually rapid um, onset, and they can almost specifically tell you the time it begins. Um, it's usually 
subkernel can be left-sided or can be anti-gaussian. Um, if they're describing radiation out of the arm, that's unusual. So that radiation is in the, the easiest bridge. It's pretty specific to the tool that they were surfered out of. Um, positional change, it's usually relieved when we lean forward because that brings the chest, um, the pericarditis, the pericardium closer to the heart and it brings that space closer together and there's not as much inflammation and rubbing. When they lay back, it separates those layers out and causes more inflammation, more, excuse me, more separation and rubbing. Other associated symptoms we see in these patients are cough, shortness of breath, dyspnea, hiccups. Also, we'll see a previous history of viral infection in these patients that will lead us um, to think of the viral origin. Um, some other past medical history may give us clues to some other type of etiology like they may have a history of rheumatoid arthritis, a contusion, or a bacterial infection. So some specific causes we could find in these patients, like I said, most common cause is idiopathic. Um, infections are also a common cause. Viral, um, such as Coxsackie, adeno, echovirus, CMV, hepatitis, HIV, and mono. Bacterial, such as uh, pneumococcus, staph, strep, mycobacterium, Lyme, influenza, and bacteria. Mycobacterial are also common causes, heating and mast as well. Fungal infections as well, histoplasmosis and coccidiosis, um, protozoal, and then immune, immunoinflammatory connective tissue disease, like I mentioned, rheumatoid, scleroderma, lupus, and then mixed connective tissue infection. Um, other immune inflammatory, arteritis, inflammatory bowel, host MI, respiratory syndrome, which we'll talk about later. Post cardiotomy, thoracotomy, trauma, and then drug induced. Neoplastic diseases also can be causes. We can have primary causes, which are more unusual. It's usually a secondary cause, usually a metastatic um, origin. Primary causes are mesothelioma, fibrosarcoma, or lymphoma, lymphoma, excuse me. Secondary causes are breast and lung, lymphoma, and retinoblastoma. Radiation induced is a common cause. These um, a lot of times there are acute causes and they can lead to conservative causes that we usually have to worry about them later. Um, post heart transplant and then chemopericardium induced trauma, post procedures we have to be aware of and then dissection of the brain. Also trauma, blunt or penetrating trauma. And then one thing we also have to remember in post cardiac pulmonary resuscitation can also cause um, pericarditis as well. Congenital cysts or congenital absence of a pericardium. Miscellaneous, such as cholesterol, renal failure. We used to see it a lot in patients before we had dialysis, and we see it pretty significant with your renal um, pericarditis. But we also now have dialysis in this form. Um, chylopericardium, thyroid cancer. So on physical exams, usually in a patient with uncomplicated pericarditis, the patient has um, difficulty finding positions that make them feel more comfortable. Even though they lean forward and make it feel a little bit better, they still have a lot of pleuritic pain that really can't feel comfortable at all. You can have low-grade fever. You can have sinus tachycardia. You'll hear a friction rub. Um, this is due to contact between those two layers we mentioned earlier. There's three components to this. There's ventricular systole, early diastolic filling, and then central sinus. Um, a lot of times you'll hear it in the literature and when you listen. It's described as when someone walks over the snow. Sometimes that feels really crunchy. And sometimes they say it's like um, pulling apart of Velcro almost or something like that. I can't remember what it's called. It's best heard at the left sternal border when the patient's leaning forward. It, the sound can come and go during the hospital stay due to how like inflammation is going on, how much fluid is in their pericardial sac. So it's important to listen throughout their entire station or throughout the day. You may hear it at different times. During their workup, important things to assess, EKG, classic findings are ST elevation. Um, it's a diffuse ST elevation. Um, it should be an all lead. They mentioned it shouldn't be, um, it you probably won't see it in ABR. And it should be distinguishable from acute MI because it's a diffuse lesion. It's usually just in the tissue and doesn't really make it for um, diagnosis in the acute form. PR depression is often, often accompanied as well. And these EKG changes can persist for weeks to months. So it's important once the patient's been treated, you've gotten control of their pain when you discharge the patient. It's important that the patient knows this. It's 
some of their discharge information. Um, you know, we often have patients that are will go to multiple hospitals for a good reason. It is so important that they know that if they're going to be going to another hospital, they know they might see elevation so people don't panic. Um, other findings we may find, if a patient has Lyme disease as well, you may see AD block. Um, also, we may see pulses elect electrical alternating ends, which I'll show you this study later, um, or low volts as we see them. Lab data, you'll see a modest elevation in WBC, usually a mild lymphocytosis. In idiopathic causes, you can see a significant elevation in white count. You may want you, um, you may want to alert um, yourself to other causes, you may be a bacterial cause or something that's going on. And then elevated cardiac enzymes um, indicate that there's probably myocardial involvement as well. Um, if you see a significant elevation, you need to be concerned that this pericarditis is either presenting sign of an acute MI. So you need to make sure to get good history physical exam to make sure that that's not what's actually going on. Chest x-ray oftentimes is normal in idiopathic pericarditis. Um, some things to look at if you see pulmonary infiltrate may lead you to a uh, diagnosis of viral or bacterial causes. Oftentimes PD specifically, PD pericarditis may not have a history of a pulmonary um, issue as well. And then pulmonary lesions and lymph nodes may be found in the path of a preeclampsia. So um, echocardiogram may be normal in most patients. The main reason that we recommend performing that in a patient is we want to um, check for an effusion. We want to make sure they've come very deep into the effusion. Moderate to large effusions are unusual in um, idiopathic um, acute pericarditis, but um, if you do see one, it may lead you down the path of some other cause of different etiology. Um, it provides added information too for possible myocardial involvement as well or pulmonary lesions. So the main management of these patients, you want to Treat for specific causes if you're seeing all these other things, a very large effusion, if you're seeing a really high white count, um, you want to rule out those other causes because they're probably not just idiopathic. If you want to detect for an effusion or tamponade, you want to alleviate symptoms. Um, you want to go down your path and check all your lab values. Usually idiopathic pericarditis is self-limiting. Um, the reoccurrence without complications, the reoccurrence in about 70 to 90 percent of patients usually do pretty well. Treatment is NSAIDs, ibuprofen, 600 milligrams to 800 CIV, um, with dis discontinuation. Um, the pain is no longer present after about two weeks. You can obviously utilize aspirin as well for about one to two weeks. Um, also, one thing to consider in these patients is to make sure they're on um, AC or PCI medications if you see high doses of um, NSAIDs in these patients. We don't want to cause extra problems for them. Like I said before, they usually respond pretty well to NSAIDs. Um, patients that do not respond well usually have very large effusions and other causes other than idiopathic. Um, sometimes supplementary narcotics may be needed, and the addition of colchicine can be used as well. It's usually two to three milligrams loading dose followed by a one milligram um, daily clinical dosing. Um, also be sure to watch your comorbid, comorbid conditions and your health care factors if you're seeing any. And then steroids. We've mentioned steroids. I know people have heard steroid treatment in the past. We discourage using them unless you absolutely have to. They've shown um, to cause reoccurrence more often. Um, unless they absolutely have to be used, we'd probably recommend just using NSAIDs. If you have to, you can give prednisone 60 milligrams daily for two days. The goal is to taper them down to zero to three milligrams. So now complications with acute pericarditis. There's effusion, tamponade, and then chronic pericarditis can eventually lead to restriction. So an average on a 31-month 30 30 follow-up, 3.1 had tamponade and 1.5 no constriction. So while they can occur, complications can actually lead to restriction. 15 to 30 percent of patients with acute idiopathic pericarditis usually respond well, but do have some relapse. Women who failed initial treatment um, were more likely to relapse. Recurrent pain is actually associated, isn't associated with all the other signs. Usually they just present with pain. And recurrence beyond initial relapse is recommended to have colchicine prophylaxis. Um, they also recommend using NSAIDs with them as well. So initial relapse, go ahead and do another form of NSAID. Um, complication rate um, following recurrent pericarditis is still low. They still do pretty well. Long-term prognosis is still good. And they're still um, supposed to be taking a nominal effusion. 
recurrence of spike colchicine in SIG. One option is a brief course of steroids, and these patients usually at that point will recommend steroids, and they actually um, recommend very low doses on a patient who can do statistically well. Um, they don't recommend standard steroids for this patient. So pericardial effusion, accumulation of transidate, exudate, or blood of pericardial stat. It's usually associated 14% of the time with heart failure, 21% of the time with valvular disease, and 15% of the time with liver. Some of our causes, as we've mentioned before, with pericarditis, viral HIV, bacterial, fungal TB, um, mediastinal radiation. With cardiac surgery, post-op patients, majority occurred on post-op day two. Maximum size was by day 10, usually involved in 10 months post-op. We also found with transplant patients, when they did have a, a pericardial effusion, it also increased the chance of acute pain um, as a form of medication. Um, chest trauma is another cause. Again, we make you always have to watch patients post-cast. Um, drug and toxin involvement can cause it. Metabolic disorders are usually found with lots of them. Malignancy, lung, breast, Hodgkin's and liver leukemia are common causes. Collagen vascular disorder, when you're idiopathic or chronic tissue disease with pericarditis, that starts leaking down the back where you can't really see it. So when we look when we look at studies, characteristics beyond culture and psychology usually don't give us much diagnostic value. Those are the two main reasons we do pericardial effusion in some of our people, is to get culture or um, to rule out any neoplastic disorder, disorders down at the bottom here, um, whether it's a metastatic manifestation or just actual complications that are indicated in the pericardial effusion. Um, we, sh we saw in a retrospective study of 173 patients, no biochemical, but cell count provided a diagnostic criteria for the use of metastatic manifestations. And so the main reasons we do it is just culture, psychology, and patients are symptomatic and usually have some sort of underlying disease. So infectious etiologies, we want to determine if it's an exudate or transudate and culture to allow for appropriate antibiotic use. Hemorrhagic effusion, we want to see if it's intrapericardial bleeding versus malignancy. It kind of rules you out if it's sanguinous um, or serosanguinous. Um, sometimes we can have an infection that can lead to some sort of inflammatory disorder. Chylus pericardial or effusion, um, makes you a little more concerned if there's a compression of ligaments. We'll have to do that on a patient who's had more progressive pericarditis. If you have a past type of pericarditis, it's rare that you see it. And then panic nods and other symptoms. So that's characterized by equalization of atrial pericardial pressure. There's an exaggerated inspira inspiratory decrease in arterial systolic pressure. So we start to see um, arterial hypotension and we get culture paradoxical post op bleeding as well. So there's um, overall, our transmural pressures are zero and sometimes we see some decrease. We get a reduced preload and then our, we get a reduced cardiac output. So overall, our venous return starts to decrease and our cardiac output starts to fall. So acutely, we start to see in our patients um, dyspnea with associated chest tightness and dizziness. Um, with mild tamponade, we see uh, pericardial pressures of 1 to 10. Um, moderate, we see 15 to 20. Mild tamponade is usually asymptomatic. Venous pressure is greatly increased with, like I mentioned earlier, arterial pressure is starting to be zero. And then we mentioned, I mentioned some of our causes before. We start to get cardiac compression when it's rapid. The patient starts to show chest fullness, dysphagia, cardiac, pericardial pain. If it's less rapid, it's, it's a slower process. We start to see increased abdominal GERD, increasing edema, and you may actually see a systemic cause. For example, if they have um, some other cause for it, you may see those other signs before you actually start to see other things start to develop in the patient that are systemic. Here are some specific subcategories of it. Low pressure tamponade, these patients won't present exactly like a normal tamponade because they have hypovolemia. They present a little bit differently. On echo, we'll, they'll see the same changes. Um, and then regional, these patients usually um, have um, a regional tamponade, so one area like just the atrium is collapsing or just one section, and that's due to pericardium or an MI, one of the two main areas. Now, pulse is paradoxical. You've all kind of heard this in medical school. Um, it's where we see an inspiratory reduction in systolic pressure greater than 10. The way we measure this is we take um, a blood pressure cuff, we um, take the blood pressure cuff up and we listen for pop sounds just in, um, when, during expiration. We 
take the blood pressure at that point. Then we bring down the blood pressure cuff until we can hear those sounds all through the entire rest of the hearing process. And then if we see a difference in those two blood pressure measurements, the greater than or greater than, we can talk about the doctor and that would be the end of the hearing. Other things we find on physical exam are muffled heart sound, pericardial friction rub, uh, Ewart sound, which is actually dullness and compression is often used for how large the pericardial effusion is. It actually compresses the left lower lobe. Um, two small signs. Usually we hear this more in restrictive pericarditis. It's, it's during inspiration, we actually see this increase in um, regular beating pressure um, due to the fact that there's not an actual fall in the inner femoral pressure. And then Beck's triad, which is hypotension, hypotension muffled heart sound, and elevated ventricular pressure. So physiology, just the main things. In normal pressure, in, in normal um, venous return, we have a two surge um, return, the ventricular rejection, and then early diastole, the main way we get return is diastole. But in tamponade, we lose the early diastole portion because pressure is just too high. Um, so systolic, syst systolic ventricular function um, is often super normal. Unreleased tamponade becomes fatal because that venous return doesn't come in because of the increased pressure. It can't overcome it. And then with decreased venous return, we don't have enough output to determine the extent of um, circulation. So our diagnostic studies, x-ray, EKG, echo, and cardiac echo. So here's one of our um, x-rays. You can see the large silhouette here. It's often called the water bottle film. If you look at it from the right or from this angle, you can see the cardiac silhouette is pretty impressive. And then I mentioned electrical alternators. If you look at each QRS, this one's smaller, larger, smaller, larger. And it's actually, um, the heart is within the pericardial sac, which is very enlarged and full of fluid. And the actual heart is swinging to and from within the cardiac um, pericardial sac. And as it moves towards the electrode, so you see the electrode, you see the QRS get larger. And as it moves away, it gets smaller. So you can see it actually moving, that's kind of an EKG version of it moving to and from. So on echo findings, this is what we actually see when we call um, to let everyone know that you know we're preparing for the tamponade. We actually see septal movement is our kind of our visualization of a pulse in the periosteum. During inspiration, um, we see the right side of the heart fill, and we accommodate that due to the constriction from the pericardial sac. We see the ventricular and atrial septum moving to the left to accommodate. And then during expiration, it moves back to the right so that the left side can fill. And that's where we have um, difficulty when the cardiac output almost collapses to the left side because it's not getting enough side flow to the left side. And that's why you're using the static pulse during that inspiration. Also, we see chamber collapse, like I mentioned. During, the early, during early diastole, the right ventricular wall invaginates. And at the end of diastole, the right atrial wall invaginates. We also see that eventually the left atrial wall will collapse and it's more, even more severe. Here's a diagram. Um, you can see here in inspiration, this is the triclectic valve. This would be the right side of the heart and left side of the heart. This is how we see the right side of the heart. So you'll see more inflow on the right side of the heart and the septum moves this way to accommodate. And then during expiration, you see the left side of the heart increase. That's what we're actually seeing. And then here's a different diagram. We see variation across the valve because of decreased flow on the right side. Um, right heart cath will confirm tamponade. When we go in and we measure the right atrial pulmonary wedge pressure and pulmonary arterial pressures will all be elevated from the 30 millimeter mercury and they will be equal to the septum. Pericardial pressure will be elevated equal to the right arterial pressure. Cardiac output will be reduced, and our SVR will be reduced. So the main treatment of tamponade is drainage of the pericardial fluid by pericardiostasis. The main way that um, we do it will be under, we mainly do it under fluoroscopy uh, with actual visualization. <coughs> the tip of the needle will be visualized with imaging. We also will utilize ECG electrodes. We'll attach them to the needle. Um, as we're going in, we'll watch the EKG, if we come in contact with the pericardium, we'll actually see ST elevation in the pericardium. Um, but we're 
was visualizing as we were going through the movie. There are some times when we can't, pericardial, um, pericardial contusion is not ideal. Um, usually we like to do it if there's fluid on the two anterior portions or if it's at the apex. If fluid's posteriorly, um, it's not where we can get at it very well. We need to direct blood through a good drainage. Also, if there's no pericardial bleeding or clotted <coughs> hemopericardium, um, we also recommend surgical drainage at that point. In other specific situations, there's reaccumulation after nasal drainage. At that point, we'll recommend surgical drainage as well. Bleeding as well. If it's loculated, um, if there's a biopsy that's required, um, we can't get as many biopsies as a needle, so that'll require surgery anyways. So we recommend surgical drainage. And then also, if there's a coagulopathy, if you're going to have bleeding as well, we like to do surgical drainage. Medical treatment's amazing in these patients because they're very hypertensive, they're unstable. Um, in the meantime, before we can get the pericardial contusion, the main thing is fluid resuscitation. It's helping you get a bunch of units to come back if you can, helps increase the blood pressure. It's the main thing in this case. You can try inotropic pressure support, but um, ideally it's fluid resuscitation. It's already an overworked part that's trying to maintain um, forward flow. Um, and then try to avoid mechanical ventilation. Sometimes you have to do what you have to do in that situation, but when you innovate the patient, you're going to decrease um, preload and units return because you're going to increase interparathic pressure, which is makes your treatment easy, decreases the unit pressure, so it's a decreased output. Now, constricted pericarditis, um, it's a complication of the inflammatory process. Um, in developing countries, it's usually idiopathic post-surgical radiation injury. It used to be TB, but we've gotten better medications, so it's a little less likely. It usually occurs within weeks of the initial injury, but most often it's over many weeks. They create um, a distinct fibrous calcified layer um, with adhesion between our tendons. The scarred pericardium creates a restricting atrium that prevents filling of the heart. It's a little bit similar to, the tamp uh, to tamponade. You get equalization between chambers and the systemic and pulmonary vein. Limited filling causes systemic um, congestion. Congestion, you'll see patients with an acetylmegaly, peripheral edema, anxiety. You get reduced cardiac output. Patients can present also with severe fatigue, weight loss, muscle weakness. Um, ejection fraction of these patients can be reduced for two reasons. Um, one of them is due to a decreased preload, um, and we'll find that they actually have a reserve contractile component. It's just that their preload is so low, and they appear to not be able to pump much out. Or you can have myocardial involvement, and the fibrosis is actually involved with the myocardium, and those can actually increase as well. Because even if the treatment is pericarditis, where we actually peel off the fibrosis pericardium, you would still have a reduced PF after that. So those can be affected as well. So like I mentioned before, uh, abdominal pain, hepatic congestion. Um, on these patients, you have to make sure that um, a, lot of, a lot of times they're mistaken for patients with primary liver issues and right-sided heart failure, so we have to make sure that we're not confusing them for those two patients as well. Physical exam, two small signs I mentioned earlier. Um, we have an increased jugular venous pressure um, that during inspiration a normal person would decrease, but it actually may have increased because the space was thin. Um, pulse is paradox in about a third of the patients. These are the patients who we also have to treat. Pericardial NOS, which is a great screening needle here in Ward. Um, it's an early diastolic sound vector to the left border. What it is is you hear it corresponds to early abrupt cessation of ventricular filling. The heart will fill and then abruptly stop because it essentially couldn't contain the other filling that was required to fill. And I mentioned the abdominal exam. You'll also see um, signs of potential liver um, congestion and failure. Reduced voltage, AFib is also present in these patients due to increased um, fluid overload and pressure. X-ray, enlarged silhouette, a lot, a lot of times you'll see calcification. There's an X-ray here that you can see right along here. Calcification. Echo findings, you'll see pericardial thickening, dysplasia of the interventricular septum. We actually see what's called a septal bounce, which is a septum that are just kind of bouncing and very um, pathognomonic for it. 
facilitation of hepatic veins, and um, we'll see the variation across the um, valves as well. One of the things we have to make sure is we'll see these variations as well in a few other COPD, RV infarction disease with this critical good extreme infection that we're going to show. Cardiac cath um, is also something we need to be looking at. Uh, right atrial, right ventricular to diastolic wedge and bust ventricular diastolic pressures will be elevated equal. Pressures all should be close to about two millimeter uh, mercury. They're all within about three of each other. Um, you rarely see a, a difference. And then a specific thing we see um, is a diastolic dip followed by a leveling off. Follow the endocrinologist across the center. So you'll see a dip and then a plateau repeatedly um, back in the pulmonary field and then down again. Specifically in our hemodynamics and in that lab. Um, CT is something else that um, is something important, especially if the patient's just been decided they're going to go for pericardectomy. It's important for the um, surgeon. It gives them a good idea um, the location, how much thickening we extend, what areas involved. And usually a normal pericardium is less than one millimeter. So some of the ways we can distinguish it from restrictive, pericardial knot is suggestive of constrictive. Septal bounce is suggestive of constrictive. Thickened ventricles with an infiltrative process leads us more to think it's constrictive, such as you know prostates with such an amyloid and constriction. If the LV pressure is greater than the right pressure, it's restrictive. They tend to be more constrictive. Equal pressures are more deadly. So if there's associated pulmonary hypertension, makes you think constrictive. You know, normal lungs are more normal. So the management, the definitive treatment in these patients is pericardectomy. That's where we typically, surgeons typically go in and take off the pericardium at that point. Um, medical management in the meantime is diuretic and salt restriction. Tachycardia is a compensatory mechanism in these patients. Um, so if you guys that have taken cardio, you remember the equation. Cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate. So these people have difficulty breathing. They have pretty much nil stroke volume limits, no preload coming in. So the only way they're compensating to keep their cardiac output up is by heart rate. So if you decrease their heart rate, their cardiac output will fall. So you have beta blockers and calcium channel blockers should be avoided in these patients if possible. Um, should be avoided in AFib if possible. You would often have to refer for advanced surgery. You want to maintain a heart rate of 80 to 90. And following surgery, these patients actually do pretty well, usually in the patients that have a main chain of death. Um, 7 to 80% remain free from um, adverse outcomes in five years, 40 to 50% in 10 years. It also depends on what comorbid causes are going on. Patients that specifically don't do well off radiation-induced renal patients, high pulmonary rate is still a threat. So surgery itself has about a 5 to 10 Specific pericarditis, um, just to kind of go through what, how we kind of treat them. Viral pericarditis, like I mentioned, is the most common type. That's usually what we think most um, idiopathic are. Um, it's usually by direct virus injury or by the autoimmune uh, immune response to it. Echovirus and Coxsackie virus are the most common. CMV is the most common in our immunocompromised patients. Um, definitive diagnosis can be done by dissection of DNA by PCR mammogram. These patients are self-limiting. They usually do pretty well in these long walks with us. Bacterial pericarditis is usually associated with a cardiac effusion. It's usually due to direct extension of a pneumonia or influenza virus um, in the majority of um, cases. Common causes are staph, strep, and pneumonia. Pneumococcal effusion. Hematogenous spread after surgery or trauma is important to remember. In anaerobic organisms can be found via neocytal neck or head kind of infection. Also, um, oral origins can be a, um, a spread, and then spread from meningitis. I found it interesting in bacteria causes, it's actually a sterile effusion in their response to penicillin. Clinical presentation, they'll present like most bacterial infections do, shaking chills, fever, um, dizziness, that's for sure known. Gas-producing organisms can also create an airflow hemorrhage, so we mentioned that in the If it is bacterial pericarditis, you need a medical emergency, and that does actually happen in our patients. Three to four days of drainage and fluid culture. Um, you would obviously start rotting the body from the aerobic kind of culture. And this prognosis is actually very poor for the vast majority of patients. Pericarditis and HIV, which we probably see with these patients, 
20% of HIV patients will have pericardial involvement. It's actually the most common cardiac manifestation and the most common abnormality of diffusion. In most of these patients, it's thought to be papillary release syndrome. Large effusions could be concerned for an infection or an epidemiology. Constricted pericarditis is very rare. And in this uh, population, it should be concerned for mycobacteria. Symptomatic effusions, like I said, are often asymptomatic and traumatic. Neoplasms, what you should worry about, are most often autoimmune. Asymptomatic patients, um, small to moderate effusions with ongoing treatment. Symptomatic, they treat with hormone and hormonal ones, or just drainage. And here, retrovirals have actually decreased in most patients. TB, one to eight percent of patients will develop pericardial involvement. Um, it's actually the most common cause in developing nations of constricted pericarditis. Seventy percent of the large group will have con pericardial involvement. Mortality is seventy to forty percent. It's the most common cause of per pericardial effusion after congestive heart failure. Secondary threat can have pulmonary origin or can be can be caused from threat from a friend or family member. Um, they present similar similar to TB pulmonary diffusion as well. Um, diagnosis from pericardial fluid is very low. Um, the main thing to obtain pericardial fluid is actually an exocyte. Um, biopsy is of higher yield for two granuloma. Um, other diseases you'll see with granulomas with the pericardium are RA or sarcoid. You can get um, adenosine laminate from the fluid. You can also get neurosparangoma that can be caused by that. So treatment, symptoms, treat tamponade with pericardium. Tamponade, multidrug um, treatment. There's debate right now pericardiocentesis versus open surgical drainage. There's more leaning towards open um, drainage because these patients are more likely to be receiving care treatment. So it's more likely that they'll benefit from open surgical drainage. Um, and then steroids, they don't they don't increase the mortality, and it's thought that they may possibly treat a blood leukemia patient with open surgical drainage. In the renal patient, um, Uremia pericarditis is decreased due to our use of HD now. Um, we do find that there's an HD-related one. Um, <coughs> this is usually due to volume overload. We find that in patients that are just going to go through HD multiple times intensely, and the fluid is reduced quite a bit in response to the low tissue. Um, we also caution um, in these patients with very large effusions, um, heparin should tend to be cautious and use very unsteady form of pericarditis. Um, if they're not hemodynamically optimized, like I said, they can really cause some problems. Um, AMSED use, like I said, as you see, nephrologists and patient families are just like, all they see is all this infection in the room. <laughs> um, Dressler syndrome, this is your late post-MI response. This is an autoimmune inflammatory response. It usually occurs one week to two months afterwards. Um, fusion is common, tamponade is unusual. Treatment's aspirin, 600 milligrams PIV or QIV for two to five weeks. Um, we don't recommend steroids in these patients because it can convert your spine to a scar, which increases your wall thinning, which can lead to rupture. NSAIDs, we're always weary of NSAIDs in the coronary artery because they tend to be very inflammatory. And then colchicine, possibly like um, effective in these patients. We've not seen a lot of studies, but helpful in other types of pericarditis, like with open surgery. Um, you can use prednisone if you ask your pastor to help you manage Radiation-induced pericarditis. Um, I've mentioned these uh, cancers before. Um, Radiation-induced pericarditis um, has the worst prognosis. Uh, it's kind of dependent on the total dose, amount of heart exposed, and the source of the radiation. 2% incident, 20% of the entire pericardium is exposed. Late constriction usually happens about 20 years, 20 years after that. Um, usually occurs due to uh, pericardial implant. It can happen from a primary tumor, but it's unlikely. Lung cancer is the most common. Ethylene lymphoma is the second most common. And then autoimmune. These patients um, usually respond about like our acute pericarditis that they give you. Um, they treat them similarly. One of the things to remember in RA patients are um, patients that are being treated with anti-tumor necrosis factor. You need to make sure if you, you know, an RA patient is doing well and you start them on that medication and then all of a sudden they develop pericarditis, you need to make sure it's not the drug that's causing it, that they're exposed to. Um, lupus patients, pericarditis is the most common cardiac manifestation, so they have two different types of cancers and they respond to the same way, similarly to all the other cancers. So 
scleroderma, um, these patients have somewhat of an unpredictable response to hearing aids and hearing aids as well. One of the things you have to be very careful in scleroderma is these patients have a uh, propensity to get pulmonary hypertension. You need to make sure when they come in they have any chest pain, any shortness of breath, and they're having pericarditis and they're not actually pulmonary hypertension. So you need to be very careful when you're doing these kinds of things with these patients. patient, um, there's no identifying relative on here, but she's a 45-year-old that um, she had been at home having increasing fatigue, loss of appetite, um, weight loss, muscle wasting, hasn't been doing well, has past medical history and um, age, previous history of back, um, presented to the ICU, um, overall hasn't been doing very well. So I'll kind of just go over her echo really fast. Um, you look here, this is, um, here is our right ventricle, left ventricle, aortic valve, aorta, or left atrium, mitral valve. If you look here, she's pretty thickened, myoc uh, myocardium, and then here the question is whether there's a scleroma or calcification here. see here she doesn't have as much pericardium, calcified pericardium, you can see the beginning of early tamponade, and then she's in intermittent tamponade. Um, so she has a history of constrictive effusive um, pericarditis, 